Enter, rejoice, and log in. One more time. Enter, rejoice, and log in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and log in. Enter, rejoice, and log in. I don't know about you, but hearing Tom sing those words to open our service this morning feels like a balm to my soul after a pretty tough week. I'm so glad we are able to gather together, tap into the joy of connection, and steady our hearts as we grow resilience. I now invite us all to take a breath together before we light our flaming chalice. The chalice is a symbol of our UU faith. If you have a chalice or a candle at home, it is time now to light it together as we say the same words we say each week at our fellowship. If you have a chalice at home or a candle, it would be great if you would have that now and we'll light it together. We, we light, light this flame as, as a symbol of new life, enlightening our way, way as, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let the lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. I am Marie Luna, your Director of Congregational Life. Thank you for welcoming us into your home today. It is good to be together, even when we have to be physically apart. If you are joining us from another Unitarian Universalist congregation, welcome. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend you a special welcome. I encourage you to reach out to us to find out more about our fellowship. I am very happy to help you get connected here at the fellowship. I will put my email address in the chat box and it is also on the screen. I hope that you will reach out. Today's service is being led and supported by Allie Peters, our intern minister, Reverend Christina Leon Tracy, our senior minister, Reverend Leah Angiri, our associate minister, Dave Velguth, our lay worship leader, Steve Seek, our music director, our wonderful musicians and singers, and Adam Robinson, our AV tech. Thank you to everyone who's made this morning service possible. This year, we are focusing on growing resilience. We are digging in to what it means to grow ourselves and our community to be sources of life, even when things get tough. Right now, we are in the theme of flexibility. Thank you for joining us as we remember the power of change, growth, and bending under pressure. We're so glad you're here. I invite you to settle in to your space, wherever you are, setting aside your week in whatever way you are able so that we can be together fully, even from afar. Hi, Leah. 
Thank you for joining me for the Wonder Box today. <clears throat> it's so much fun to get to open the box with friends. Oh, thanks for asking me, Ali. I'm really happy to do this with you. And so I, I wonder what's inside the box today. Yeah, we take time to wonder because as Unitarian Universalists, we know that wondering is an important skill. In fact, fostering a lifelong sense of curiosity is one of my favorite parts of being a Unitarian Universalist. Mm -hmm. It allows me to continually learn and to change my mind as I learn. <clears throat> now, Leah, just so you know, I'm not actually in Wisconsin right now. So I don't have our usual wonder box with me, but I do have this one. I hope it'll do. Okay. What do you think is inside? Ooh, I don't know. I hope that all of you watching at home or wherever you are will type your guesses into the chat box so that we can read them. You can also ask your grown up to type your guess for you. My kids and I love reading what people guess each week. Me too. So, what do you think? Hmm. Well, it's cold out. Could it be a sweater? Or maybe like, I don't know, a shovel? Oh, is it pizza, do you think? <laughs> that would be great. And those are great guesses. And I can't wait to read all the guesses from everyone from wherever they are. Okay, are you ready? Drum roll, please. It's hiking boots. Oh. Well, I love to go on walks in nature with my family. And I could imagine those coming in handy, although at this time of year, at least in Wisconsin, some snowshoes might be even more handy. Yeah, I'm in New Jersey. We don't have as much snow on the ground. So these are going to be perfect because I'm planning on going for a hike today. So I think I might need these. Oh, my goodness. There's actually more stuff in here, too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's my phone. I was wondering where that was. <laughs> I think this will probably come in handy on my hike in case I get lost and need to pull up a map um, or in case I need to call someone, right? Um, let's see. Oh, also a mask in case I run into people on my hike. You know, we have to keep each other safe, right? Yeah, that's really important these days. And oh, there's my water bottle in case I get thirsty. Yeah, that's a good idea. And let's see, there's another water bottle in case I finish that first one. Oh, okay. Um, there's also a flashlight, um, you know, for if it gets dark. Uh, Allie, um, how long do you think you're going to be out there for? I wonder if it would make sense to just plan to be back before it gets dark. Oh, I'm only going for like an hour long hike this afternoon, but but the flashlight is in case I get really lost and can't make it back before dark. I guess that makes sense if it just helps you feel better. Well, I really appreciate you showing me what's in the Wonder Box. I think this is a great service so far. So wait, take wait care and yeah, don't, don't log off. There's more in the box. There's more? There's more. Yeah, there's some deli turkey. In case you, like, get hungry on the hike. Or I figure if I see a bear... Uh, she might like turkey, so I could just like throw this in the other direction and then run away while she's distracted. Holly, are there bears where you are hiking? This is not actually sounding very safe. Mm -hmm. I've never seen one there and I haven't heard of any bears there, but you know, I want to be prepared just in case, right? And that's not all that's in this wonder box. Um, there's band-aids in case I get hurt, right? There's a blanket in case my coat isn't warm enough, right? Um, oh, there's sunglasses in case it gets too sunny. There's matches in case I need to start a fire. Mm, there's an extra pair of socks. Well, they don't match, but there's an extra pair of socks in case my socks get wet. Um, that's all that's in the box, but I'm sure there's more that I'm missing that I should. Wait, 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 wait. Allie, first of all, um, I'm not really sure how you plan on carrying everything, but more than that, um, just big picture, this really seems like a lot for just a one hour hike. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know. But my backpack is going to be really heavy. Um, it's not gonna be fun to carry all that stuff with me, but you know what? So much hard and unexpected stuff happened this past year. And honestly, Leah, I didn't feel prepared for any of it. Schools closed. We stopped being able to spend time with our friends. People have been getting really sick and so much other hard stuff too has happened. And, and I just haven't felt prepared. So my goal this year is that I want to be prepared for anything. Yeah, I really, I think I really understand where you're coming from because this past year has been especially hard and really unexpected days. And I actually think it is really smart to try to be prepared um, in the ways that we can. So I, I, I really can understand how you were feeling when you packed all those things in there. You know, though, trying to think of every possible thing that could go wrong even though it does make sense in a way, I'm not sure if that actually always is what we need to do to prepare. Sometimes it just drains our energy and overfills our backpack. And then it's harder to deal with the tough stuff that does happen. And then it's really hard to even have space to deal with the good stuff too. And sometimes that happens as well, you know? Yeah, you make a really good point, Leah. I wonder if maybe there are other ways to be prepared. Like what? Well, taking care of our hearts and our spirits are ways that can help us deal with the tough stuff. It's important to notice that um, when you feel unprepared or anxious, that, that scared feeling Um, sometimes it makes sense to just remind yourself that it's actually okay to feel that way. Sometimes that's the logical way to experience what's happening. Sometimes when I am just caught in this wave of this really big, hard feeling, I put my heart, um, I put my hand on my heart or I put my feet on the floor to comfort myself. And then I just take some deep breaths and that helps me feel a little calmer in my body that can be grounding. And then the part that's in my mind is I have to just remind myself or even say it out loud in the mirror that if something happens that I didn't expect that I'll be able to figure out how to handle it, that I can talk to people I love who will help me that that I can find the resources when I need to. Hmm. It's really good advice, Leah. I, I feel better already. I, I think I'm going to try to do that. I might not always remember to do it. I might, it might not always be easy, but it does sound like something that's helpful to try. And I hope all of us can remember that during the rest of this service. And as we go about our lives this week, like, it's okay to feel unprepared or anxious. And also that we can trust that if something difficult happens, we'll be able to figure out how to handle it or we will be able to find the resources to handle it. Thank you. Got it. That's the perfect attitude. And I hope you have a really fun time on your hike. Thanks, Leah. I think I'll just, I'll wear my boots. I'll take my mask and my phone, and maybe just one water bottle. Yeah, that sounds really good. I think you have the perfect plan. Bye. See you later. Thanks, Leo. Bye. Inside your soul's the kindling of the hearth for pilgrims new. Find the spirit always restless. Find it in each mind and heart. Touch and hold that ancient yearning.
kindling for a newfound truth. Our reading today is from American poet, philosopher, and writer Mark Nepo. It is a piece called Surprised by Care. Try as we do, the things that matter, the things that enliven us and shape us, can't be prepared for, only met. Ultimately, preparation is more about being centered and present than anticipating every possible outcome. How does a bird prepare to fly? It lets go of the rim of its nest. How does a fish prepare for the waterfall? It swims headlong over the edge. How does a heart receive and send blood? It keeps pumping. For us, meeting each moment means letting go and swimming over the edge while our heart keeps pumping. And when we can stop anticipating life and simply meet life, we are surprised by care. Often we get lost in over preparation. If not careful, our endless anticipation can hood us from the moment at hand. We can become so mired in our plans and their alternatives that there's very little left in us to meet what actually comes our way. The distraction of being overprepared is beautifully captured in this wonderful haiku about baseball by Cor van den Heuvel. The batter checks the placement of his feet. Strike one. Whatever task we face, whatever decisions or turning points we approach, there will always come a time when to recheck our stance one last time will pull us out of the moment we've been preparing for and will miss our small or large destiny. In such crossed moments, we're challenged to trust our preparation rather than go over it one more time. In actuality, trusting ourselves and our work is the culmination of our preparation. No one ever told me that the mastery of preparation is to put down all the planning and enter with trust the moment prepared for. No one ever taught me how to do this. But clearly, whether entering a moment of surgery or love or being washed over with a wave of creativity or winded by the sudden death of a loved one, the truth that helps us live waits like a clear pool for us to dive in, a baptism born by entering the moment at hand. Stand we now upon the threshold, facing futures yet unknown. Hearth behind us, wayside hostel, built by those who knew wild roads. Guard we their sacred embers, carried Good morning, everybody. My name is Dave Valguth, and I'm your lay worship leader this morning. And I was asked to uh, provide a reflection regarding resilience and uh, come what may. And right now, we've all been dealing with 
uh, a lot of stuff that you need resilience in order to just make it through your daily lives and I know I've shared in the past about uh, some things I was able to do athletically before I got hurt and like winning punt pass and kick and uh, hitting a home run knowing what it feels like to do a lot of those things so I feel very fortunate what I what I haven't shared is the what happened the day of my accident and I, I really believe that I'm a good example of someone who has been resilient or knows know what it's like to have to be resilient dealing with what I've dealt with and um, it was June 12, 1979 um, just a few days after 8th grade let out for the summer and uh, a bunch of my friends and I we biked out to Plum and Park which is north of uh, Appleton a little bit lived on the north side of town so we just biked out there something we had done many times uh, summers before and we set up our area up at the top of the hill there's a fence that goes all the way around it halfway down is grass halfway down is sand and a um, bunch of friends and I raced from the top of the hill ran down into the water when we got into the water a certain distance uh, we dove in and when I dove the uh, my head hit the hit the bottom of the pool the sandy pool and just fluke thing hit it the wrong way and that was it went uh, into shock right away and then I woke up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital with my brother next to me he was the head lifeguard at the pool that day and that's where um, my necessity to be resilient began um, it didn't happen right away uh, I was very uh, unresilient for four years before uh, I had an epiphany and realized that um, I had to stop feeling sorry for myself and if I was going to make anything of myself I had to go to school and uh, leave home and looking back it was the best thing that I did for myself and I've had to deal with a lot of resilience since then being told that you know you're you're not going to be able to have kids and I've got two girls uh, you're not going to be able to, to work and I've been full-time employed for over 30 years um, you can't you know expect to drive and I I drive just fine I've driven since I was 16 without any accidents and uh, a couple speeding tickets but um, the job market is another place I've had to be, be resilient knowing I'm qualified or better qualified than other people that have gotten jobs in front of me. Um, I've had to be resilient looking at sports on TV because, you know, I used to do those and I feel I should be on there. And uh, watching the news every day, you know, just seeing what people are, are getting away with or, or trying to get away with it really is staggering and it just keeps continuing so your um, ability to be resilient has to uh, you know increase because you know just the, the news that comes at you and what's happening in society and politics and uh, in the long run it'll make you a tougher stronger person with COVID-19 as humans we've had to deal with um, plagues and, and viruses and flus in the past that have taken many more than have ta the COVID-19 has taken doesn't make it any less serious but it's been less than a year and we've already been able to come out with a vaccine um, hopefully we'll all have had that or at least the opportunity to get it um, within the coming months and we can all be together again so um, 
be resilient, be strong. Things will improve. But uh, I'm an example of what some resilience can do. It, it pays off in the end. Thank you so much, Dave, for sharing your story and your insights with all of us. Thank you. And right now, I'd like to invite us all into another breath together. You know, before pursuing a career in the ministry, I was actually a middle school math teacher. And I know that we have plenty of current and former teachers here at the fellowship, so I probably don't need to say any of this, but for those of you who may not know, the first year of teaching is brutal, brutal. It just is for so many reasons, and mine was no different. I taught at a startup charter school in a city in New Jersey. And if I'm honest, every day just felt like a new chaos that I could not have predicted. Some of my most vivid memories of the time are actually the mornings before school. I always made it a point to get to the building way before the start of the school day because I knew that once students started arriving for breakfast, the day would just feel like an avalanche, an avalanche of student needs and administrative needs and unexpected problems and new challenges and heartaches and struggles. I got there early to prepare, to brace myself for that avalanche, to batten down the hatches, of my classroom, if you will. It was always me and our beloved custodian, Felix, who would enter together in the darkness of the early morning and turn on the first lights of the building together. Now this will sound silly, but what I remember mostly doing during those early mornings was actually sharpening pencils. You see, if I had enough sharpened pencils on hand, I would be ready for when a student forgot their pencil or for when a student broke their pencil or I'd be ready to intercept the student who wanted to use the trip to the pencil sharpener as an opportunity to talk with his friend across the room instead of working on his lesson. I'd be ready for that student who wanted to see what would happen if you stuff drinking straws into an electric pencil sharpener hard enough. Spoiler alert, it breaks. I loved my students, but middle school is a tough and confusing age for kids. And I struggled to manage my classroom and to teach a successful lesson that first year. Sharpening pencils was at least one little thing that I could do to avoid some problems. And so that's what I did. I sharpened pencils as if they were like little swords to ward off whatever crises were to come. I battened down the hatches for the avalanche. Every morning, Felix would come interrupt my pencil sharpening to let me know that the sun was rising. He insisted that I come with him to these big floor to ceiling windows that our building had. He would say, Peters, this is the most beautiful sunrise. You can't miss it. He said that about all the sunrises. And I would come to the window with him mostly just to appease him. But as he gazed, with wonder out at the colors in the sky, I would stand there impatiently, thinking about everything that I should be doing in my classroom. 
all those pencils that needed sharpening. American psychologist and author and Buddhist practitioner, Tara Brock, she explains that when we're in times of stress and trying to anticipate what's around the corner, it is so easy for many of us to slip into what she calls the over-controller, the impulse in us that is preoccupied with human doing rather than human being. The over-controller is preoccupied with the pencils that should be sharpened and keep, it keeps her from experiencing the sunrise. My obsession with trying to do so many things to prepare did not make me a good teacher. It didn't help me handle anything. It fed my stress, it exhausted me. And the kicker is that no matter how many pencils I sharpened, that avalanche still came and I still didn't feel able to handle it. The unexpected stuff still felt unexpected. The hard stuff still felt hard. The scary stuff still felt scary. Tara Brock elaborates a little bit more about the over-controller, pointing out that the result of regular overdoing is chronic fatigue, even exhaustion. There is no room to breathe, no rest, we lose our access <clears throat> to our own creativity and natural intelligence. We can't feel our own loneliness or sadness or yearning because the over-controller is not living in the present moment. I've been thinking a lot about this over-controller impulse lately. This past year has been its own series of avalanches, hasn't it? It's so easy for us to look for some sort of solid ground, something we can use to brace ourselves, some pencils to sharpen, some, some way to batten down the hatches in anticipation for whatever might be around the corner that we can't see. But this morning, we're reminded by Dave's words that resilience does not actually rely on preparation. It's often in spite of events that we just could not have seen coming. And in our reading, Mark Nepo points out that too much focus on preparation for what's to come can ironically stand in the way of our ability to take on whatever it is that does come, whether bad or good. Rather than steadying us on solid ground, our desire to be ready for the future will always work against us if it keeps us from being able to meet the present moment if it keeps us from taking care of our hearts and our spirits right now, if it serves as a placeholder for feeling those tough feelings that arise in us, feelings that need to be experienced and felt and metabolized so that they can move through us and so that we can move forward with clarity, and with purpose. This past week, our country survived an attempted coup, a terrorist attack on our capital at the hands of a large group of white American citizens. It is so natural to worry about what this means for us or what's ahead. That, that pit in our stomachs reminding us that this wasn't an isolated incident. The 
the panic search for some solid ground. What comes next? What should we all expect? What can we do? And so I invite us to pause, to breathe, and to honor the feelings that are arising in us. Because what happened at the Capitol on Wednesday was scary. I can't speak for you, but I know that I've been feeling confusion and anger and fear among a whole tangle of other feelings I probably have yet to name. You know, seeing the word terrorist so much in the past few days actually has me thinking quite a bit back to 9-11. After the World Trade Center attacks that day, our country's leaders responded by going to war. We weren't given a chance to pause, to truly grieve together as a nation, to process our devastation and our fears in community, to breathe and regroup so that we could move forward with that clarity and purpose. Instead, the doer came out, the over-controller. And so our country sharpened its pencils, battened down its hatches, prepared a show of force toward an entire part of the world, entire races of people. A clumsy response that distracted our nation from all of the grief and fear and devastation. In her book, See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love, sick activist and civil rights lawyer Valerie Kaur draws a clear thread from that moment after 9-11 to the poisonous displays of white nationalism that we've seen blooming in very recent years. The same white nationalism that we saw assaulting our capital on Wednesday. Trauma that goes ignored. Pain and anxiety that does not get honored and felt and metabolized can linger and fester and grow and spill out in devastating ways. So then how do we prepare ourselves to meet whatever unexpected things may come in the future? Well, first we breathe. We sit with feelings that come up with us, come up in us. We tend to those feelings, the bad and the good, the grief and the joy, the fear and the hope. We take care of our hearts and our spirits. We take care of the hearts and the spirits of our communities. We hold each other even from a distance. We make our way forward together with clarity and purpose. And we learned, and we learned to trust our own resilience. Come what may. May it be so. And amen. Going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know this, and we will pass.
get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Boyaya, 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 boyaya. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know it is. And we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Boyaya, 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 boyaya. Sharing our individual joys and concerns helps us collectively to flex and to grow, practically, spiritually, and relationally. It can be a risk to share, but one that we hope feels rewarding when you know that we are holding space for and with you while we worship this morning. You might consider typing into the chat box any personal news you wish to share with our gathered community, whether it is large or small, minor or magnificent. If you would like to talk to me, to another minister, or to a member of our care team, please let me know. Connection is available if you would appreciate it. If you'd like to be included in our weekly email, which goes out later today, you can submit your joy or concern via the form on our website or by emailing me or any member of staff. With silence can come a sense of peace, expansion, and even transformation. Let's seek it together now with this shared quiet, and then we will join our voices together. And we believe in life, and in the strength of love, and we have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give, we have our thoughts to receive, and we believe that sharing is an answer. Each week, we take time for generosity, remembering that the acts of giving and receiving are spiritual practices. As always, if you are in need of financial or emotional support, please reach out to any of our ministers, Reverend Christina, Reverend Leah, or Allie, so they can offer support, including modest financial support through the minister's discretionary fund. For those who are feeling relatively more financially secure, we want to thank you for continuing to give and ask you to keep doing so. There are several ways that you can give to the fellowship and many reasons to do so. Here are just a few. 
Hi, my name is Cindy Darling, and I'm a member of the Fox Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. One of the reasons that I still love being part of the fellowship, even during the pandemic, is that I love that connection that we still have. Being able to see everybody, you can't hug, but being able to see those smiles and those great um, faces. So I look forward to continuing to see everybody. As we come to the end of our service, we will extinguish our chalice flame, even as we still hold its light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. After our closing words, we will be having small breakout groups just like usual for 15 minutes of connection and conversation. In a moment, we will hear a short postlude song. If you don't want to participate in small group conversations, then please use that postlude music time to log off and leave this Zoom meeting. If you choose to stay, I encourage you to learn each other's names and to pay attention to the timer in the corner of your screen so that everyone gets a chance to share. And with that, go in resilience, growing in strength, go in flexibility, changing and bending, go in peace, knowing we embrace each other even now from a distance.